Hi, hi everybody. Okay, we have sound almost. Hello. Hello, hello. One sec. Hello, microphone. Hello, microphone. Hi, 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 hi. I want more microphone power. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Cool. Okay. Hi, everybody. Let's get going. Uh, let me share my screen and talk. All right. So the plan today, we're going to be talking about midterm stuff. Almost exclusively, I'm guessing. Uh, let me get rid of this. And let me hide this. All right. You could be on the screen. All right. Okay, so first, um, I'm moving my office hours because at the time of my usual office hours, four to five, I'm going to be at a town hall. I'll tell you about that town hall in a sec. So I'm just going to move my office hours to tomorrow, four to five, Thursday instead of today. Um, the other thing I want to mention is there's a town hall and I'll be at it. Uh, the goal is to talk about the future of staffing in EECS and CS classes. It'll be in this room at four o'clock. Guessing a lot of you are like booked with maybe project, definitely midterm. So if you can't make it, that's fine, but we are gonna try and post a recording and this conversation is gonna keep going. To give you a little bit of context here, um, I wanna note that this is probably the biggest 61B that will ever exist in the future or past for the simple reason that the target number of CS graduates is likely to shrink from around 850 a year to 300 to 400 a year. This is a snapshot of kind of the whole path that everybody gets into the CS or EECS majors. You might find this kind of interesting. So you probably don't know about this global picture. Right, I'll explain in a sec. Uh, so this is basically the top path. These are all the folks that come in. Hello. Uh, these are all the folks that come in through the direct admit path. Hi, I had to take the room back. I know it's interesting, but I'm gonna leave it up there uh, and, and take the room, sorry. Uh, so the top is the EECS uh, majors. These are people who applied to the College of Engineering. These folks don't have to worry about doing the trial by fire. That is the GPA cap. And then on the uh, trial by fire path, we had in the uh, 2016 matriculants, that's people who graduated in 2020, there were 561 people who said they were LNSCS intended on their application, came to Berkeley. Some fraction of them actually declared CS, some didn't. Someone just asked what's LNSCS intended hidden. Uh, those are people who intended to do CS, but picked a different major because they assumed that applying to some other major would increase their chances of getting into Berkeley. Anybody do that? All right, so you're the CS lieutenant. Hit it. Okay, so you're in that question mark. And the discoverers are people who didn't really intend CS. Maybe they're a math major or a physics major and they got hooked. Maybe they were a linguistics major who got hooked. Point being, CS wasn't their main goal. Uh, and then we have our junior transfers into LNS CS. And so the GPA cap attrition, you know, it was 0% for a long time. And then it inched up to 35, which is too high for my, my taste, really. Um, uh, and so the goal is basically this whole system is getting completely refactored. We had an idea. The College of Letters and Sciences had a slightly different idea, but point being that the, it's going to be very different. I'm not going to go into the details today because it's not relevant to the town hall, but it's going to be this number of the targets like 300 or 400 a year. So why? Well, let me tell you slightly more. So why is the town hall happening? Well, we're going to talk about this. Like, could we bid bigger? Should we be bigger? And if we wanted to, how would we get there? But I also want to actually raise an even more serious issue, uh, which is something I was working on last year. So I was in charge, uh, I was the vice chair of the department in charge of CS Undergraduate Matters. And we had a problem, which is we had no money. We were at like a $5 million shortfall for teaching assistance. Uh, and this is an actual table from a report I sent out to the faculty to vote to um, give the chairs the authority to reduce the size of 61B from 2,500 seats to the year to 550 for the year. So we are 1,700 this semester. We are 1,000 in the fall. So that would have meant if this had happened, about 2,000 of you would have wanted to get into the class and not been able to get in. Who knew about this? Some of you, maybe? Handful, right. So this very, very, very nearly happened. Like it was close. Uh, the reason was we were out of money to hire TAs. Uh, the short version, we had a whole series of town halls and that's what we're talking about today. But the rough sense is that Central Campus gives about 50% of the money we need for TAs. And that means that for every student we get into our classes, we actually lose money as a department uh, because we, you guys cost 360 bucks or so ahead and we only get 170 uh, from campus. 
um, for TAs specifically. There's other things that you pay for, of course, like this room, um, but uh, that's the TA part. So when we are faced with this table above, basically the campus said, sorry, we don't have the money. And so we were like right there, this was about to happen, but it didn't. Anybody wanna guess how we kept classes open and why we have 2,500 who haven't looked at the next slide? Yeah. Well, that helped, um, but that didn't, but we would have still like shrinking the major was gonna happen either way. So it's a good guess. And that's how we're gonna try and be sustainable. Yeah. Some random guy wrote us a check. That's the answer. So a single person in the world heard about this, wrote us a $5 million check to cover the cost for a year. And this was literally right before phase one for classes started. Like if that check hadn't showed up, like I was ready for the apocalypse. Now I should say, I don't think this would have been 550. I think it would have been like 900 because the college of engineering was going to kick in money, but it was still going to be a catastrophe beyond imagining, especially because this would have affected, for example, these 70 seats. These are a bunch of people who had already taken A and B, and they're going to be told, sorry, there's no CS70 for you, uh, which you can imagine that'd be really, really bad. And I don't know what's going to happen next year. Tentatively, we'll be okay. We kind of have some money lined up to taper things as we move forward, but actually, TAs, uh, well, it's very complicated. So that's what the town hall is about. I don't want to muddy the water too much, but I just wanted to raise this issue that if this is interesting to you, and for many of you, maybe it's not. Like I think that you guys in this room will be relatively unaffected by this, but everybody next year and beyond will be very seriously affected. Um, if you're interested in being involved in this conversation, that's what the town hall is all about. So this is the town hall ad. I put it on the Slack. But basically, the town hall, it's co-organized by EECS, Data Science, the union that represents the TAs. And it'll be in this room 4 to 5.30. Uh, and so there's a video describing in much more detail kind of the background. Uh, there's also a data dump of if you ever wanted to look at all the spreadsheets. Actually, I'll show you a thing real quick. So hello, John De Niro. Each occasionally. All right, oh. Yeah. So it has all the spreadsheets because it's a public university. We have all the information out there. If you want to peruse and see exactly how much everything costs and where the money comes from and where it goes and how many TAs there are of every type and how much they cost and all that stuff, it's all there. You can peruse uh, it. Now, again, obviously your students, it's, and it's not same. your job to you know administer the department and come up with ideas. But if you do want to be part of this conversation, feel free to come. Okay, so just wanted to raise that. That's why I'm moving my office hours to tomorrow because I'm going to be at this thing. Uh, I'm not the vice chair this year. Actually, the thing I moved from being vice chair into is I'm trying to create an online master's program in machine learning to try and raise money to help fund teaching. So um, that's one of the things I'm working on. And there's other things that have been done in other universities, like the University of Washington directly lobbies the state of Washington's legislature to direct money to the uh, UW Seattle CS department. That's cool. We haven't done that here. So who knows what could be done? All right. So I'm happy to take questions about anything. Probably you might have questions about this, so I'm happy to talk about it for a bit, but I mostly want to focus on midterm questions. But, you know, hey, it's a society, we're part of it, happy to talk about real life stuff. So questions about anything, this, I guess this first. Anybody have any questions about this whole thing? Yeah. No, that's that's not the people that's in the application. Yeah, that's just a... Right. These are people who co come. We we estimated this number based on looking at 61A survey data, people who were excited to do CS at the beginning and then who showed up later. Yeah. This is a many years ago we did this study. It's a very rough estimate. Could be 20, could be 42. Yeah. <laughs> but once you submit the application, the uh, success rate right now is very high because it's mostly mechanical. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There will be ability to switch in in the future, but it's just going to be a lot smaller and it's going to be a holistic uh, evaluation, not GPA based. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You will be unaffected by this. Yeah. If you're in this room and you're already a student, but if you're a prospective transfer student in the room, then you might be affected by this, but everybody else, you're pretty good. Yeah. Is that the same in the future? Will be easier to transfer from LNSCS to EECS? I suspect it will be easier to transfer from LNSCS to EECS. Yes, there'll be no reason not to allow relatively fluid transfers, but hasn't been discussed. These things are super complicated. Yeah. 
I mean, there's another complicated thing, which is there might be a new college that's not letters and sciences that exists soon called computing, data science, and society. And that will incorporate what is currently LNSCS. And then EECS will still be a separate major, probably. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who knows? There's a lot of political questions around that stuff. Other questions? You're like, hey, I came here for a midterm review, not chaos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What happens when data science? So data science right now, data science, um, they're really trying to keep it wide open. The College of Letters and Sciences has it on its list of, I forget what they call them, high, high demand, impacted, capped majors, something like that. Um, so I think that there's a lot of um, administrative discussion around this. I think that there is will, i.e. Small numbers of specific people who might be willing to donate money to keep data science open. I don't know. Yeah, hard to say. I'd like data science to stay open as much as possible. I should note, by the way, the being overpacked thing, TAs are the forcing function for sure. That's why we had to go to this insane table here. Um, but there was just a lot of things that were a little bit broken. There's other parts of the story, like our faculty to student ratio is something like three times uh, higher than at other, like, equivalent institutions because our CS program is so big. So our faculty is giant in the HCS. It's like as big as anywhere except for CMU, uh, pretty much, I mean, a couple other places, but we just have a whole lot of students because we basically said, we'll try and take literally everybody we can until everything kind of started breaking a little bit. Yeah, still a little broken. I think we're having a good time. Hopefully you are. Other questions about this stuff? Yeah. Was there ever a Right. So there exists a class called 47B if you're a transfer student. And the question, what about that? So right. Question would be, is there some like lower cost instruction option where I could say, I'm going to opt for the no support. Like, I just want the I'm not going to go to anything. I'm just going to do the assignments. It's an interesting idea. I don't know. Could maybe happen. Starts to raise some interesting questions that are. Right. So there's some students who basically effectively put zero strain on resources because they come in extremely well prepared. They don't go to discussion in a lab. They just do the assignments on their own time. Not a ton of such people, but you might argue that they're low cost students. But then it gets like a little shaky. Like now we need to admit only. I mean, I don't know. In some ways, that's the bargain with college, right? Colleges admit typically they're competitive, so they, they can conceivably support everyone. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Like you get super admitted, but you just can't go to anything. It's a, a weird, a weird message to send. Uh, other questions? I'll get back to you too. But I just want to make sure if anybody else had questions about this. Okay, one more, and then we'll do midterm stuff. Yeah. Right, that's similar to what was brought up over here, the trial by supernova. You have to get all A's and you can't go to anything. Is it, but is that the society we want to live in? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Sorry, everybody else who's not those guys. Anyway, I mean, I love you guys too. But <laughs> All right. Let's do something else. Okay, what do you want to know about? Yeah. Why is getting an element and array constant time? That's a good question. So uh, basically it boils down that there's a bajillion wires inside of the physical memory and RAM. Uh, the basic picture is there's a chip. I'm just thinking of it as a block. And all right, I'm trying to do this for your Zoom. Uh, that there's a bunch of wires and you say, hey, I want address number 3 billion or whatever. And then every clock cycle within air or within, it's roughly true. It'll like grab that information. So yeah, everything's wired to be able to collect that data quickly. 61C gives some hint of that. If you go into EE and you study uh, what's called VLSI, very large scale integrated circuit design, you'll learn it. It's pretty fun, actually. I was an EE undergrad, by the way, and EE grad student. So yeah, I learned CS uh, quite late in my life. Yeah. Um, actually, someone over here, if I haven't heard from yet. Yeah. Memorize the Google Truth Library things? No, um, on the reference sheet question for the folks who've looked at the reference sheet uh, table, 
Uh, what what does the reference sheet say about the Google Truth Library? What do we tell them? What is on the reference sheet regarding the Truth Library? Their assertions. Okay, I'll get back to you. But we don't expect you to remember. Was that nothing? Okay. But we generally don't expect you to memorize uh, weird syntax. I'll say this: uh, assert that dot is equal to. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'll come over there. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to start typing. So uh, that way we have a visual. Sorry, I should have done this already. So let's suppose. Uh, oh, I'm not myself. Sorry. I have to switch to my other account. All right. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to transcribe roughly what you're saying. I think it'll be worth the time. So suppose we have a class. Yeah, like do a thing. Yep. Right. Yes, it'd be a compiler error. So if you tried to do a uh, horse dot do a thing and um, do a thing as an instance method, compiler. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Yeah. Sure. Um, this to me is the most interesting stuff to say. I'm gonna list all the things I think are important. So um, static variables are shared by all uh, instances of a class or another interpretation is part of the class itself. Okay, so let me maybe make that more clear. So example, suppose I have public class horse and then I have public static uh, int um, I don't know, num horses equals zero. Uh, and then let's suppose I have, uh, I could say horse dot num horses uh, equals five, or uh, I could do something like uh, horse h equals new horse. Uh, question for you. What do you think happens if I do this? Okay. So it turns out, though, you would, that's what I think the answer should be. I think that'd be cooler if Java did that, but it's not what it does. Uh, I'll just call this works but is bad style. Okay. Is this super important? No, but there you go. Um, you can also, by, for example, do num inside of horse class. This dot num horses works. Inside of horse class, uh, num horses works. All that. All right, questions about what I got so far in here, and then I'll talk about more static stuff. Anything about this? Yeah. This sure. Okay, I'll come back to what is the this pointer. I'll make that a separate question. What is this pointer? And I'll do a visualizer for that one. Other questions about static variables in this very specific context? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, changes the static variable. So there really is just one true horse. Let's do it real quick in the visualizer just to make this excessively clear. Oops, Java. Okay, here we go. Uh, public uh, horse, uh, public static int num horses. It's five, um, public, uh, doesn't matter. Public void go wild. Um, okay. Yeah, this seems like a good example. Num horses equals num horses plus one. Okay, horse h equals uh, new horse, and then we'll make the horse go wild. And this is terrible style, but it's instructive just to get a sense of what's going on. I think what will happen is that it should compile and work fine. So I do forward. Da, 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 da. Okay, so the way I think about it is the visualizer. Notice that we have like static fields horse dot num horses. This is like a thing that is built into. It's just floating around in the universe, separate from everybody else. When I create a separate, oh, actually, it's gonna make an instance variable too. Uh, let's make, just to make each horse special, public string name, uh, public horse string in name equals name, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then horse, um, Gerald. Okay. That's what I heard. Maybe you said Harold, but so goes. Okay. So the interesting thing about this program, if I back up a little bit, uh, is the following. So here's Gerald the horse. Uh, and the number of horses is five. When the horse h dot go wild gets called, we go in here, and when we say num horses equals num horses plus one, 
uh, it actually increments the horse uh, classes uh, num horses variable. The reason it doesn't implement Gerald's num horse is because it doesn't have a num horse. Like every horse doesn't have a number of horses. Uh, questions about this? Yeah. If you change the num horses in the constructor, like, would it mean that every time you make a new horse, it's going to reset? Like if you right. Have... Yeah. So if you did like num horses, horses times equals two, you know, that's a weird thing to do. <laughs> Let's do plus equals one. How about that? Um, horse h2 equals new horse herald no, that's not the right herald okay. okay so every time the constructor executes this is a horrible problem but we're doing it okay so oops so num horses so now we say new horse gerald set the name number of horses increments and so i do this kind of thing like this is one of the only good reasons to use a static variable that changes i'll do this in the greater occasionally where i want to keep track of how many things you make uh, like I sneak a thing into your code and then I count the number that exists, but otherwise it's a sort of strange thing to do. Questions about this example? Yeah. What is uh, the reason it's bad form? It, this, well, I think it is exceptionally weird to have a function that just increments a static variable, but if this was something called like go wild count, then maybe it's useful. Yeah. What I think what I really don't like, the style I don't like is to do something like this h dot num horses equals 20 or whatever. It's just a strange thing to do. Like, doesn't make sense to me. You shouldn't be saying h is num horses. You should just call it horse dot num horses. Um, I actually personally would kind of prefer to do this too. This has no effect. Code is exactly the same. This is also exactly the same, but I find this confusing style because it's implying that me, Gerald, I have a number of horses. That's not the case. It's like the God horse, my new book. All right, okay, cool. Other questions about this torturous example, which I think is not a bad one because it's direct on the fly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which we do. Yeah. Uh, it goes from five to six, then six to seven. Is Gerald? Oh, no, there is no Gerald's num horses. So you're saying is Gerald's num horses going to be seven? No, there's only one number. Here it is. Oh, if you did Gerald dot no, H dot num horses. Yeah, if you use bad style, it's still just accessing this single number. Right, yeah. Yeah, there's only one memory box with a number in it. So no matter if you use good style, bad style, anything else, you're getting that eight. Yeah, this is a really a juicy line of inquiry. Go. Could we also have an instance variable called num horses? Java does not allow it. I'm hoping. 99% sure. Yeah. It does? Yeah, I don't think so. I'm nine, it, I don't think it does. I just, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I'm going to say no and be 99% confident and be live with it. Yeah. Sure, the private keyword, um, I can't, okay, I'll, I, here's an interesting clarification. If I change this to private, in fact, if I only do something in this visualizer, I cannot show you an example where it doesn't work, right? No matter what I do, if I'd make anything here private, it's not gonna help me. Um, well, maybe that one will. Okay, no, it won't, all right, good. Um, so that's a hint. I cannot do it in this example. Why, somebody else? So no matter what I make private has no effect on the code, why? Yeah, you can always access it from this Java file. So what private does is if something's marked as private, another Java file can't use that. What about inner classes? Inner classes are complicated. This isn't something I'd ask on the exam, but if I had a private class node and it had its own private whatever's like a uh, private thing personal to myself, uh, then it doesn't, uh, horse can access this because node is subordinate to horse, you might not like that aesthetically, but basically this uh, horse can look inside of node because it's part of horse. But th this isn't important. We're not going to ask about it on the midterm. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, chat, please. Thank you, guys. All right. Um, I just want to say there were some questions on chat. Uh, we are not going to discuss anything that's on scope for the midterm or how to study for the midterm because that's going to be information about the midterm. Right. We're going to say is X on the midterm. 
just to yeah. report. Yeah. Uh, okay. Static methods in here. Sure. Let's do it. Well, actually, uh, yeah, let's do it. And then I'll take other questions that might come up. All right. So static methods. Uh, so let's do public static um, jump. Okay. This is starting to feel like a discussion worksheet. All right. Um, question. What do you think will happen if I do this? Public static void jump. Okay. Not good. Why is it not good? It's static and you can't access instance variables. So this is going to yell at me immediately. And it's going to say non-static cannot be referenced from a static context because you can't change my name because I'm not anybody. When you say name, this is equivalent to saying this dot name. Question? You could change num horses. That's right. You could say num horses equals negative num horses. You go real wild. Yeah. Right. Yes. So should this be static? Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. I haven't heard from you yet. Go ahead. Okay. This is slightly unrelated, but like, if you have a variable that has a different static and dynamic type, and you can pass it in. So okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna not go there yet. Uh, because uh, let's see. What is this pointer? And I'm gonna have a static dynamic type. Uh, row two Q. Okay. We'll come back to that in a little bit. I don't want to spend all the time talking only about static things. But I will take just a little bit more. Was there more in chat that was people were burning to know? No. Okay, I'll get to. Okay, I could do that in a sec. Uh, okay, a couple more on this, and then I'm gonna move on. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you could say this dot num horses, uh, because Java allows you to access static variables with a reference, but I think it's bad style. So it works, but I don't like it. Uh, let me do one more thing. Someone asked earlier about the what does this mean? Uh, oops, I have an uh, error here though. The static void this. Oh, right. Oh, sorry. It's static void jump. I forgot that we changed it to static. So that doesn't work because there is no this if the method's static. Um, okay, I'm going to take away the static method for a minute. And um, someone asked what this is. I think the best way to describe what this is is to look at what's happening when the code's running. So when I call um, go wild, in the context of go wild, a this pointer is created, which points at the calling instance. That's how you should think about this. So this is the memory box that contains the address of the thing that called the method. It's like self in Python. You can never say this equals though. This can't be reset. You can say equals this, but not this equals. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, this is the way to access. It's it's a reference to the calling instance is the better way of saying it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I haven't heard from you yet. Should we use this as a matter of style when accessing instance variables? Uh, it depends on who you're... Uh, I don't know. Probably some people say yes. I don't always, though. Yeah. We certainly don't always do it. Okay. I'm going to do... You guys really okay? I haven't heard from you yet. Yeah. What, what if you don't specify public or private? Or if you don't specify public or private, it's a different thing called package protected, which means you can only access it from the same package, which is that line at the top of the file. But we haven't taught you that. Go ahead. Um, if you were just getting go wild with static method, you can't run what it's called. You just got go wild with static method. Right. That's a good one. Okay. All right. And this is going to be, I think, my last one. If I make this public, private, whatever, we'll call it public. It doesn't matter. I'm just leaving it. Okay. Private static void go wild. When I try running this, it's not going to work. Uh, well, actually, no way. It will work because Java lets you access static members with an instance uh, name. Yeah, so this is allowed. It's just bad style. Like, it's weird that you're calling a static method with H, but it's technically allowed. And I would have preferred it not that way. Okay, I'm going to abandon static, though. I think we got the most important things about static and many of the less important ones. Um, I'm going to go actually to that question someone had about so let's see, static. I think we covered all that. Um, I think I've covered this. So then row two. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, if the object that has a static, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I right, I'm going to actually question your question. Uh, objects don't have a static type, uh, but expressions, variables, et cetera, do. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, and then you like pass it into a, like a, a method, and that method is overloaded a few different types. Mm -hmm. That's what it goes to. Um, yeah, overloaded types. I see. Okay. So let's say we have um, dog. Ex, er, da, show dog extends dog. And then we have public void um, feed uh, show dog. And then we have public void feed dog. And then we say dog D equals new show dog. Um, and then we say feed D. Which one gets called? This one gets called the static type one. Um, now, this isn't of much practical importance, so I don't think it's that important. Uh, I don't think we'd ask this on the midterm because this is starting to veer into those like annoying corner case issues, but this is the one that gets called because the compiler is going to basically think about it. it it's thinking this is the methods to get calling. You're trying to call feed on dogs. So I'm going to use this method, but yeah. Right, but past midterms talk more about these dumb corner cases, and I, I apologize. I didn't originally intend to teach it. It just like slowly crept into the class as the TAs come up with cooler questions at discussion. Yeah. Yeah, if you do that, you get the other one. Right, you can do that. But a little beyond the scope of our test. Yeah. Oh, wait, shh, sorry. All right, okay, this one is in scope. I like this question. So if we had uh, show dog SD equals D, the question is, would this work? Yeah, it will not work. The compiler is too scared. Okay, it does, it th the, the reasoning is not all show dogs, or not all dogs are show dogs. And the reason, maybe the simpler way of putting it is to create that little table right here. So uh, we can say, for that last line, static type, dynamic type of reference object. So we have um, D, static type of D is what? Oh, static dog. dog, right? Sure. And what's the dynamic type of the object D points to? Show dog, okay. So then when we get to this SD line, what the compiler does is it like, it looks at this table. That's the way you should think about it. So we declare this new variable SD, its static type is show dog. And then when it's trying to decide, is this allowed? So it's initially null before you assign it, but it's gonna say SD, like, can I put a dog in a show dog box? No, nope. that's the idea. It's very dumb. It just looks at this column. This is all it's considered. And remember this is also called the compile time type. And that's a hint. The compiler only considers the compile time types. Okay. Uh, other questions? I'll go to that old midterm question if you guys want. Yeah, go ahead. Static classes. Static classes. Uh, <laughs> just question mark. Okay. Here's what you need to know about static classes. Um, if a class, if an inner, if a nested class. Uh, is static, then it cannot access its enclosing um, classes variables. So for example, if I have public class S list, and then I have public class node, uh, and this has a size field, um, static class, um, then what happens is like code in here can't access the S list size. Um, there's another thing, though, which is that if a nested class is static, um, it doesn't get the uh, generic type from its enclosing classes. So that's why in project 1A, uh, you should have non-static node class. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I mean, there's a way around this. Uh, I feel like this is kind of silly, though. This is what's more important. I'm going to delete that. It's too confusing. Yeah. This is the most important. Yeah, other questions. Okay, actually, I need to type so I, otherwise I'll lose track. Okay, uh, suppose you have an instant method. Uh huh. Yeah, you can do this, but it's bad style. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you use this? I don't remember. Anybody know? I don't know. This kind of is it this? I'm not sure if it's this because it's like the node, but mm. yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. You don't need to memorize the methods from S list and E list, but certainly having done project 1A so that you know kind of like what a doubly linked is and the idea of a circular sentinel is important, but we don't expect you to have memorized all the methods. I actually don't know. Justin, uh, are they allowed to use any method they can think of from, say, an S list, or is it only a list of predefined methods? From Suppose they're using an S list. You may, use the, they, you may use everything on the reference card and only the things on the reference sheet. Okay, you may use anything on the reference sheet otherwise, and only the things on the reference sheet. The best part, unless otherwise specified. Okay, cool. I like that answer. That means you have the reference sheet as your guideline and you're not expected to like remember some goofball thing. Sure. If we don't say there's a size method, you can't use it unless otherwise specified. It's what I hear from Justin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's the difference between a runtime error and a compile error? How do we know what kind of error was? Right. The difference between compile time error. So compile time error are the errors in IntelliJ that won't let your code run. Um, you get little red squigglies. Um, so these are issues. Oh. Ah, sweet. These are issues like um, dog D equals, sorry, show dog SD equals new dog, right? It just doesn't compute, doesn't make sense, doesn't go in. Um, runtime, oops. Runtime errors um, are things that crash when code is running. And how do you know? You just have to kind of remember the two categories. So what's an example of a runtime error? Yeah, div well, divide by, Z what's something that comes up in our class though? Infinite loop, right? Okay, so that'll happen. Infinite loop, stack overflow basically. What else? Out of bounds, exceptions, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Could I specify a dog to be a show dog? What do you mean? Can I fix this somehow? Yeah. Oh, what happens if you do this? That's a really good question. That'll be a runtime error and it'll be a class cast exception. So let me talk about that actually. I think it's kind of interesting. What happens if I do that? Okay, uh, oops, sorry, I left off piece. Okay, uh, this cast tells the compiler, hey, uh, back off, I know what I'm doing. I'm doing, please don't type check this. Uh, then at runtime, task fails. Okay, that's all. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you say you declare a class, like you instantiate something. Also, if you declare a class at runtime, I don't think it uses any memory, um, but that's it's sort of an implementation. Well, but if you declare a class, like you would just say like public class, whatever, um, you know, useless class, like I just add it to IntelliJ. I don't think it, say again. Oh, right. Oh, I see, I see. So suppose I do, um, public dog d equals null. I don't want to waste this memory. Right. Um, well, the thing is when your code actually runs, you're not going to really have this thing. It doesn't really exist. I mean, like there's going to be some optimizations. It's going to be a register value at some point. All of it's like, yeah. Like, like what actually happens when the computer runs is irrelevant. Like this, the code that runs, if you do this, I bet it never even actually exists. So yeah, there's no way to free a variable 
but it's all like micro optimizations that are below our level of abstraction. Good, I mean, interesting question. Yeah. Run the function according to the, yeah, I mean, just back to this show doc thing here, right here. Yeah. You would do, you would do a cast if you wanted to, but we don't want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Does something happen in Java? It, like, is this a practical concern for real programs? Are you wasting memory? No. But I think the answer in that question is way beyond the scope of our class. It's an interesting one, but yeah. Like the mere declaration of a variable doesn't do anything necessarily. Yeah, but. Right, so I think that, uh, I think the correct interpretation from the box and pointer diagram is to draw a box that is sitting there with 64 bits at the ready. Yeah, that's how I would do it. Yeah. Strings are objects, yeah. So a string is an object and actually you can look up the code for the string class, string.java. Let's go find, oh, oops. And we can uh, try to interpret it as a URL, string.java, uh, GitHub. Here we go, this is Java 7. So what is a string? It is, here's the code for string. It's just like any other Java code. It's in the package called Java Lang. There's a lot of comments because it's industrial string. So it's a final class, don't worry. Well, it means it can't be uh, extended. Uh, it implements some things. Uh, what does it have? It has an array of characters, okay? And it's final, meaning it can't be redirected to somewhere else. It has an offset and a count and a hash uh, and a serial version UID, okay? So it's, it's just like anything else, yeah. <laughs> yeah right that makes sense if you have a static inner class you can access static outer yeah right that's what i would expect yeah okay yep yeah right so strings strings in java are immutable so for example if i say s equals horse that's my word of the day um, I can't, there's no way to like, obviously you can't do that, um, but there's no like set zero to Z, like th these don't exist. And that's a choice that Java made. The idea is like that way, you know that when you get a string, if you give someone a string, they can't touch it, safe for you. You can pass strings to any method and be assured that they're not going to mess with your string, guaranteed, unless they use the reflections library. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, implements versus extends. Luckily, that's an easy one. Um, we use implements uh, to implement an interface. We use extends to extend the class and otherwise they're exactly the same. Um, there is, uh, this is 99% true. There are other, there's a case that we won't talk about where you have an interface that extends another interface, but that's beside the point, yeah. Um, so when solving a question, you have to decide whether to put implements or extends. I don't think I can follow. Um, could you try rephrasing one more time? Sorry. No pressure. Huh? It asks, what is that object's? Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry to put you on the spot and not quite get it. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, I'll take you next. Yeah. Can you go through the pass by value and pass by reference? Pass by value versus pass by reference, sure. Um, Java is only passed by value, uh, but people don't necessarily get this. Okay, this is a little beyond the scope of the class. I'm gonna try and do it really fast, but the idea is that when I call f of, um, so if I say horse h equals new horse, um, and I do f of h, um, 
we pass the value of h. What is the value of h? The address, the address uh, stored in h. So that might feel like it's passed by reference, but it's not. Um, passed by reference would be a little different. If we had a true passed by value uh, language, it'd be called f of x. And a passed by reference language, you could change x in such a way that the real x changes, like the actual thing, like the memory box. You can think of it as the whole memory box gets passed and they could be manipulated. Um, so because Java is not a passed by reference language, when this function is done, h will still point at the same object guaranteed. Like no matter what this function f does, h is still going to be pointing at that object. That object could change in any way, but it's not going to point at something totally new. Yeah. That, but you could change, you could change, like h points at some horse. Here's the horse. You could like rearrange its limbs or whatever, but it's still going to be pointing at that horse. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it, it's a subtle distinction. And because we haven't talked about pass by reference, I don't know that it made sense. But anyway, people argue this, but it really is a pass by value language. So that some of the values are references. Uh, someone over here had a question. There you go. Second row. Oh, second row. Yeah. Generic types. Uh, what you need to know about generic types is when declaring a class that can take generic types, uh, we do public, uh, let's say um, public. I'm just going to do the example you have, array deck. Uh, we do something like this. Um, so during declaration, we defer the choice of what type uh, to include. Actually, I'm going to do a double. How about this? Array map, kv. So uh, this class has two generic types. We haven't seen that yet, k and b. You can pick them at instantiation. That's the idea. Um, when instantiating, um, we use uh, bracket notation to specify the type. So the, the actual type to fill in the type parameter. Um, K and B are sometimes called type parameters. I don't remember if I actually said that in our class. Uh, and so I would say something like array map, like string to a horse, uh, AM equals new array map. Uh, anything to follow on this question? So let's suppose we do, you know, like what, what happens if we do this, are you asking? Yeah, so if you do that, it's technically allowed in Java. What you won't get is type checking in the compiler. And if you start trying to put other types, it will let you. Yeah. Uh, you might say that's a good thing because now you can store anything. But what's bad about being able to store anything? You can store anything, right? Too much complexity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. And then I'll come to you. Interfaces. I don't think I quite follow. I think what maybe you're getting at is um, there's no way to instantiate an interface directly. Yeah, right. So you can't say like, no, you can't say uh, new list, not allowed. All right, go ahead. I'm speed rounding it. Uh, this right. We have the this pointer. How about the that pointer? <laughs> doesn't exist. I don't think. I mean, does it exist? Hope not. What? But you can add it to Java. Make your own version of the that. Right. Yeah. This exists, but not that. Yeah. How does system dot array copy work? Um, like, what's the syntax, or how does it behave? Oh, right. So the arguments are. From from index to to index uh, num um, num is the number of things to copy num to copy yeah uh, that's from array oh right to start uh, to array start index from array start index yeah yeah better names go ahead. Um, I am, I'm a generally a fan of showing them the way this will be my last question, I think. Uh, so we gotta go. So I'm generally a fan of doing it this way. I don't, I don't know. I think we would say because there's some ambiguity because of the way, whoops, public value string, mainstream. Um, 
I think that depending on how you've used the visualize, you might've seen it other way. So just the last thing I'm gonna do, string s equals h. Um, if you do this, what Java visualizer does by default is put it in the box. You're basically asking, is that okay? Uh, we would say, but ideally, I think the better picture is if you do it this way, I think, yeah. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, I can take a couple more questions right after. And I'll also have office hours tomorrow at four o'clock. Thanks everybody. And maybe see you at the town hall at four o'clock today. Yeah, we did it.